Sports Card Nation. The hobby is the people. Weekly news and interviews. It's your number one source. Sports Card Nation. The hobby is the people. Sports Card Nation. What is up? Episode 189 coming at you. Got a great show today. You know, we talk about the history of cards and how important the past is to today's card game, if you will, the history of today, right? And while the cards of yesteryear may not be as shiny, chromey uh, as we've gotten accustomed to, there were no jersey cards or even autograph cards, those cards really set the tone for what we have today. They're the bridge. They're like players, right? The players of the past set the tone for the players we currently have. And one of the things we don't talk enough about, I think, is the, you know, the card art that was on the back of the cards in the late 50s, 60s, and 70s. And, you know, they told a lot about the player depicted on the front of the card. We, we can make an argument other than the picture. Obviously, that's what we collect cards for is the fronts. The, really, the most useful information was on the back, right? Between stats and these little card art blurbs that gave us information like their hobbies, their off-season jobs, nicknames, records they hold, things they did in high school, uh, who knows what, right? It, it shared a lot of sort of personal information with those card art and the blurbs that went along with them. And we sometimes forget about it or take it for granted. Well, the gentleman on today's show didn't take it for granted, and he has the largest collection of original Topps uh, card art uh, on the planet. His name is Mr. David Moody. Uh, he was kind enough even to send me, a, you know, a... Uh, one of the original card art, uh, which sits on my desk now, from the uh, 78 football set. Uh, and uh, it's a, just an important part of hobby history that, frankly, doesn't get hardly any attention, if any at all. And so, uh, you know, Mr. Moody, who, who uh, David, who listens to the show, you know, say, hey, I, I collect this. Uh, my stuff's, you know, some of my collection's been in the Hall of Fame. I've been featured in the Hall of Fame magazine. And I think this would be, you know, John, I know you care about the hobby. I know you care about the history, which is obviously true. Uh, I'd love to come on and talk about it. And uh, I said, I'd love to have you come on and talk about it. And here we are with that episode. And so, uh, you know, I think you'll find it uh, very interesting. Uh, and, you know, a little tease here. There's going to be something that he says that I still can't believe and still find stunning uh, to this day. And I don't believe it, but it's true. And so uh, we're going to we're going to learn what that is uh, during the interview. Uh, so with that being said, let's get this show started. This is Sports Card Nation. Time for our Hobby is the People Announcer of the Week. Hey, this is Jeremy with BST Sport Cards, the platform that has uh, no seller fees. Just want to remind everyone, the Hobby is the People. If you'd like to be the Hobby is the People Announcer of the Week, do a WAV or MP3 file and send it to sportscardnationpc at gmail.com. Are you a new sports cards collector or someone returning to the hobby? Maybe you're just looking for a friendly, trustworthy hobby community to hang out with and enjoy collecting. Midwest Box Breaks has been bringing collectors together for many years with affordable breaks, helpful threads, and a Discord group packed with generous people who genuinely care about the hobby and other collectors. Check out the breaks at MidwestBoxBreaks.com. Our goal is to bring you as much value as possible. Also, find us on Twitter at Midwest Box Breaks. Hey folks, John here. Just wanted to remind you, use the discount code MBB10 for 10% off your first order at MidwestBoxBreaks.com. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to 
happy to talk to the next gentleman I have here on the sports card shop at Moco guest line and he is the uh probably the the master collector of original tops are and we're going to learn uh, all about that you know you might hear that and, and think of kind of the stuff you're currently seeing uh which is which is still art but uh, we're talking about the original stuff uh you saw back in the on the back of cards that uh, taught us a lot about the players uh, we loved, and uh, uh, my next guest, uh, I'm going to bring him on, uh, Mr. David Moody. Welcome to Sports Card Nation. Oh, John, it's great to be on your show. I've been a listener for at least three years. If I go back, I know you go back a little bit longer than that. I got Sports Card Nation and Hobby Quick Hits in my ears. I take walks, so you've been my companion on many walks around Seattle, so thanks for having me on t- today, John. In fact, a super big thanks for taking the time to talk with me because I know you're getting ready for the national. Yeah. Yeah. But it's always time uh, for the hobby. And and this is, you know, while maybe to some newer collectors, if you will, uh, this might be sort of uncharted territory for someone who, who, you know, uh, even starting in 79, uh, I went back and started to collect the cards from the fifties and sixties. And so these card backs, you know, are, are old hat to me, but, important hat uh to say the least and uh you know like i've been talking to you off the air i've learned uh, we learned a lot about these players we learned more from the card backs than the the card fronts and and the art uh that uh, went along with those uh, tidbits uh of information i want to uh mention uh your lifelong resident of the state of washington you're currently in seattle and you're married dad of three and uh you know you reached out to me and said, hey, John, I want to talk about this. I don't think we talk about this enough. And you're right. Uh, I, you know, in knowing what it was, I'm like, we don't. This is such an important part of the history of the hobby, not only for me personally, but for, for many, many others as well. And it's also important, even if you're a newer collector or someone that's not really aware of sort of the importance of this, this is why we are where we are. It's that br- I always say that that bridge from back then to now. This is important. So, well, some newer folks will think card art and they'll think Project Twenty Twenty or Top yes. Seventy. That exists, and I think those artists and many have been on this show, uh, David. Those artists themselves would would tip their caps uh, to the artists that sort of uh, sort of broke that you know broke through and broke that ice. Uh, uh, to allow card art to be uh, such an important part uh, of the hobby. Your your thoughts on just some of the, what I said there? Well, I mean, I I completely agree. I um, have really enjoyed Project 2020. I collected many of those with our two sons. Like you said, we have three kids, and our boys and I collected Project 2020. In fact, uh, our oldest son wrote to Blake Jameson and received a, a nice letter back, and so – I really appreciate the art that they're creating now. It's really exciting. Uh, We're talking about the artists at Tops that were uh, drawing the cartoons and the cartoons for the player-specific cartoons, the trivia questions on the back of cards going way back into the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. And, um, you know, I started uh, looking at cards and buying cards when I uh, I was really really young. I grew up uh, in in the country outside the city limits of Olympia, and uh, I would walk about a block down the road to a place called the Gull Harbor Mercantile, where there was gas pumps and, you know, groceries and beer and hardware and even feed for livestock. And I was allowed to walk there when I was really young, and I fell in love with 1974 Topps baseball cards, 10 cents a pack. I started yeah. to collect those, but as a six-year-old, the cartoons on the back were my favorite. Um, I bought those packs, both football and baseball. And, you know, back then 10 cents a pack was doable, even as a six or seven year old. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. And and like you said, you know, you can watch a player on a TV, on TV during a game. You can listen to the broadcast. You can figure out who your favorite player or players are or team. 
Um, but the information on those card art backs, you know, the, the blurb you get along with the art, filled in a, a lot of the blanks that the, the live broadcast uh, didn't go. And I learned a lot of, uh, you know, you know, we talk about baseball, the sanctity of the record book, right? We, you know, it's the one sport, like most baseball fans can tell you kind of what the thresholds are for hitting streaks. Yes. Most, you know, most career home runs, most home runs in the season, highest batting average, who won the triple crown, you know, how many players hit 400, you know, die hard and even not so die hard baseball fans. Those numbers are, are like so, you know, important. And I learned about many of them through those those card backs, through those card art, uh, along with other things. You know, like you know, it would have the players' uh, hobbies, what they did in the, in their spare time, in their free time. You yes. know, we're we're talking about an era where the the pay scale is not what we know it as today. So many of these guys had to have off season jobs until the season started. Uh, so you learn what those were, whether it was you know selling insurance. Uh, you know, work, you know, owning a bony, bowling alley, whatever the case uh, may be. And you, you weren't going to get that stuff necessarily uh, from a live broadcast. And so uh, it was so important. And, uh, and obviously uh, on the card backs you had uh, along with that, all the stats and, and that sort of thing. And so uh, the backs in, 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 in many cases became more valuable than the fronts, even though the fronts were the attractive uh, part of the card because it represented, you know, a picture uh, of the player. So, I, you know, when you when you you know reach out to me and said, "Hey, I like to talk about this," and I was a little bit, uh, to be honest with you, a little bit disappointed in myself, David. That like, I, I you you heard what I said? I was right away, like, "Yeah, we got it." But I was a little disappointed in myself that it took you reaching out to me to like realize the importance in why I didn't sort of delve into that uh, on my own. And so it was sort of like the light bulb went on uh, and I'm glad we're, we're talking now, but uh, you know, the importance of that uh, is, is important. And it's, it, I think it's important for even the people who don't collect vintage or don't care about vintage like me or you might, um, it, it's still important to whether you, if you like the current hobby without that, we wouldn't have, you know, the current hobby. If you like Tops Project 2020, Project 70, Project 100, or whatever they're going to, the next card art project's going to call be called, it's that original card art that sort of paved the way. You know, like Jackie, you know, we talk about players, right? Jackie Robinson's my guy, sort of paved the way, breaking the color barrier so that we, you know, we had baseball integration. It's kind of the same thing. Uh, with with card art and, and and so when you you said hey I have uh, you know and I want to talk a little bit about that you uh, you have uh, probably the greatest well, collection well let me, go ahead let, yeah, let's go ahead. let's let's uh, define what the tops card art is because it's it's kind of a it's kind of a broad category um, yeah. but and, and and certainly no apologies for for not picking up on this and 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 featuring card art on a show as we're going to talk about later in the broadcast. Same thing with the Hall of Fame. And when they found out about these pieces, um, it was a real honor to display some of these pieces at, at the Hall of Fame here over the last year in their shoebox uh, treasures yeah. um, exhibit. So like you said, for the card collectors from the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, and then the folks like yourself that opened for the first time in 79 and then went back, uh, they remember the cartoons that appeared on the reverse side of the player's card. Some years didn't include cartoons, but most years did all the way through the 70s, most of the 60s, a little bit in the 50s. And unfortunately, those cards that you picked up in 79, it, there weren't cartoons yeah. that year. Um, yeah. But for the most part, cartoons were a regular feature on tops issues, baseball, football, basketball, hockey. And they appeared, as you said, on the reverse side, along with the stats. Some years, the cartoon might feature a trivia question. Some years, the cartoon was player-specific. Those player-specific cartoons are the ones that are the most memorable. Like, you know, Joe Namath, Joe's a very eligible bachelor with a woman chasing him, you know, wearing a short skirt. Uh, that's on the back of his 72 card. Uh, Lou Brock, 1974, 
who owns and operates a flower shop in the off season. Lou's standing there in a baseball. He is a cartoon Lou, but he's in a baseball outfit holding a bouquet of flowers. So the artist at Tops would draw these cartoons in pencil, pen, and ink. The artist would use an art board, which is really stiff cardstock, like an acid-free cardstock. Maybe if you look at an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, maybe four or five times that size. And then yeah. using a ruler would divide the board into separate spaces. The board itself stays intact, but creates different squares. And then there'd be a separate cartoon in each space on the board, depending on the size of the board, eight, 10, 12, 15 individual player cartoons would fit on the board. And so for example, the board that included the Lou Brock cartoon might be drawn on the same art board as Al Bumbry and, you know, Johnny Bench, Larry Boa, uh, and the artist finished the board, the board itself with the original cartoon artwork would stay intact but Tops would take each individual cartoon and photograph it from the board and then use that in the production of the card that matched the cartoon. And for years, these original artworks were stored away at Tops in some storage closet. And luckily they were well-preserved. That's Tops original card art. These are one of one cartoons that were used in the production of all these baseball cards and cartoons that collectors have seen through the years, millions and millions of cards, but only one of the original pieces of art for each. Yeah. And, you know, even, even myself who are very familiar with those cartoons and the card art, you don't realize they got that image. Uh, an artist had to produce that image. Like you said, they photographed it. We didn't, you know, at least I didn't think about, well, where is that original card art it was it was you going to take a quick break but we'll be right back after that with more from david moody like the athletes we admire the sports card shop is changing the game we're not launching threes bombing drives or hitting dingers but we have built a unique gathering spot for all collectors to trade cards talk sports play games and watch their favorite athletes on the big screens Yes, we've partnered with Panini, Upper Deck, Leaf, Tops, Fanatics, Pokemon, and others to bring you all the latest in sealed wax and singles. But the sports card shop in New Buffalo, Michigan is much, much more. Our recent expansion brings collectible sneakers, Hot Wheels, and more sports and entertainment memorabilia into the mix. Our new Collector's Cave game room is the perfect place to throw a rip party, bring friends, rip packs, trade cards, play billiards, ping pong, shuffleboard, classic arcade, and Xbox games, all while watching your favorite sport on TV. Visit us at thesportscardshop.com. Follow us on social at underscore sports card shop or better yet, visit us in person to learn about special events, party packages, new products and everything we're doing for you. The Sports Card Shop, connecting people, sports and the hobby around the world. Welcome back to Sports Card Nation. We are back with more with David Moody. So I guess my question to you, David, is when did you first, you know, how did it come about? We said, hey, these these pieces exist. How do I start getting them? Uh, and, you know, where did your journey uh, pick up with, with the card art? Well, I, you know, as a collector, as a little boy, I love these cartoons. I love baseball, football cards, especially. I love the cartoons on the back. I kind of forgot about it. So I'm in college and I go to a card show in summer, fall of 1989. And that's a really important year for, for this card art because it was a month after um, what's probably the biggest uh, auction in the history of our hobby took place in New York City in August of 1989. And I could talk about that here in a bit. Yes. That's the Tops auction uh, run by Guernsey's Auction House. I didn't know that happened. So the next month I'm at this card show in Seattle with my friend. And, you know, it's the summer, fall of 89, Ken Griffey Jr. rookie cards are really what everyone's after. Um, you know, people like yourself, you're buying up Greg Jeffries rookie cards. But <laughs> I see this incredible item. I, I see a full sheet of nine original cartoons from the 69 baseball set. And I just had to have it. I bought the full sheet. It was the only one there. I bought it for $65, which was a lot of money uh, to me at the time. 
Yeah. And this incredibly warm, you talk about people who, you know, go to shows and they have tables and the hobby is the people, uh, these incredibly mm-hmm. warm and knowledgeable uh, people, a couple were full of stories about a tops auction in New York city. They're talked about it. Like, you know, it was like uh, the land of Oz that they had just attended. And it turns out, that this tops auction is one of the most legendary auctions in the history of our hobby. And that's where they picked up this piece. So I buy it. It's my favorite um, piece in my collection. Even of all my cards, I just, I, I love this original art. And I went then and I got the 69 cards that were, you know, the cartoons match the cards. I picked up the baseball cards. Sure enough, the cartoon on the back matches the original cartoon on this board. And I just thought it was so special. And I kept that. I had it framed and I kept it for years. And I started to do some research on what was this auction in 1989. And um, I mean, you were living in Brooklyn, maybe in 89. In 89. So I had come to Syracuse then. So I was in high school here. When I graduated high school, which was 90, I actually went back to Brooklyn. So I was actually in Syracuse just for a few high school years and then returned to New York in, you know, uh, the summer of, of, well, I wish we would have been at this auction together in 89 because <laughs> it was incredible. It was held at, you know, I'm not, I'm from Seattle. I'm not real familiar with New York city. It was held at a place yeah. called the Hunter college Sportsplex in August of 1989. It lasted three days and top sold, the contracts between tops and star players, the mantle yeah. contract, the maze contract. This is an item that is unbelievable. They sold the original paintings from the 1953 tops cards, yeah. the original yeah. oil of paintings, including mantle and maze and your favorite Jackie. Um, yeah. I have the price realized sheet for that. The, the mantle, even back in 89 went for $121,000. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Jackie went for 71 grand. Um, wow. anyway, the, but in addition to that, they sold this tops original card art, the full art boards of these cartoons containing the, you know, the original one of ones, not just baseball, but football, basketball, and hockey too. Not every year tops kept a few in its storage shed, which they then roll out about 13 years later, but much of this artwork was sold at the Guernsey's New York tops auction in August of 1989. That's where the board came from that I bought from that nice couple in Seattle about a month after the auction. But I go to school, I go to graduate school, I start my life and I, that's just my one and only piece of artwork Mm -hmm. until 2002 when top starts to sell the rest of these through eBay and a thing they call the Tops Vault. Now, do you think, I mean, obviously we, we, we can't say with certainty, but do you think they, they held this stuff back uh, kind of knowing it might be, you know, might garner more attention, more uh, money from more financial gain uh, years later than in 1989? Or do you think it was just like, I don't just think have, so, John. Just coincidence. I don't think so. I, I, in my mind, there's a crew at Tops who's putting together everything they can to bring to this auction, and they just don't have time to scoop up a few years of card art. Um, yeah. You know, I, I don't think there was a, a method to their madness. I don't think they were trying to maximize profits later. I think maybe if they would have looked in the right closet, the stuff they sold in 2002 and 2003, they probably would have sold it in 89. I'm glad they didn't. Um, they had a fairly large grouping of full size art boards that were still being stored at tops. And in 2002 and three top sold the rest of it, all of it um, through eBay, through this place called the tops vault. And that's when I start, I saw it, I started to acquire more. It included the 72 and 74 and 75 baseball, uh, 74 and 78 football, many, many full-size sheets. Um, So up until that time, I just had the one sheet that I'd purchased in 89 of that 1969 card art. And then um, the Topps Vault card art came and there was, 
uh, at first, it didn't seem like that many people were really watching this stuff. And then bidding war started. It started to really, really ratchet up. So yeah, that was um, going to be my question. How how competitive was it? Do you know, was it something that it was sort of, you know, your little secret at first and then more people start becoming aware. So those prices uh, started to increase as, you know, bidding wars. Uh, well, occurred. they started to increase so much, John, that um, after the tops auction in 1989, um, all the all these were sold in the full size boards with the uh, many cartoons on each board, and people would start to cut them up to maximize uh, profits. Yeah. Uh, the full size boards are the holy grail, but people started to cut them um, because it was more profitable to sell individual cartoons. Um, and so, Tops started to see that on the auction in 2002 and 2003 that the full size boards were going for a lot, lot more. And at the very end, with their last boards, which was 74 football, they started cutting them up into individuals. The 74 and 78, um, I was able to obtain several full-size boards, and then they started chopping them up into individuals. Um, yeah. And for those out there, obviously, like anything, right, the, you know, the, 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 the full sheets are going to carry more uh, of, a, of a, you know, a premium price because they're uncut and uh, they're intact rather than nine nine or twelve individual pieces, which are still cool. Well I you know, you were you were gracious enough uh to donate uh one that uh is uh on my desk here uh from uh football and uh I love it. it but uh you know like you said the full sheets are the grail uh you know because uh people saw dollar signs and started to uh try to make individual you know make something of nine or 12 into nine different uh, auctions uh, and 12 different auctions rather than nine different sales one. instead of one. And yeah. I think, yeah. You know, depending on the star power of the player that that was probably working, but you know, even those singles, I would still try, I would still bid on singles. Um, they're still one of ones. There's only one of each out there. They're just not on that full size uncut board in the, manner that it was uh, created by those artists time to hear from one of our great sponsors but sports card nation will be right back after that iron sports cards is your number one source for all your psa and other grading submissions their elite status improves turnaround times heck they even provide the card savers their chat rooms provide updates on all your submissions they also offer wax options and single cards to cover all the bases Check them out on Facebook at Iron Sports Cards Group or on the web at ironsportscards.com or even give them a call at 1-877-I-R-O-N-P-S-A. Rob's got you covered. Let's go! You are listening to the Sports Card Nation podcast. So you, you've got probably, you know, let's be real, you know, the greatest uh, original card art collection. Like how many, when someone asks you how much do you have, how do you answer that? Well, I try to be vague because I, I, I'm not I'm not sure I know exactly how many full size boards. I have a sheet where I've listed all the I have the baseball and the football separated from I have some hockey, some basketball. I I have more than a hundred full size boards. Wow. Um which includes all all four sports. Um, mm-hmm. you know, boards are like Boards are like cards. If there's a Hall of Famer it, it, on the board, it's worth more. If there's yeah. two Hall of Famers on a board, it's even worth more. If there's a rookie Hall of Famer, uh, that would really be worth more. Um, and there's boards, which I love, that are just all commons. But yeah. the art's the same. It's wonderful. Now, now, how do you store these? How do you store your collection? Well, the uh, the the art boards themselves that these were created on are acid free. Uh, yep. they hold up really well. The, the pen and ink drawings look like they were just done yesterday. They look really nice. I keep them out of the light and, and I've stored most of these in a, in a bank vault. Um, I, you know, I do pull them out from time to time when I'm looking something up or enjoying them with the kids. Uh, uh, I, I pulled a few to look at before I talked to you here today, John, but, um, yep. they're out of the light. And, yeah. uh, you know, they're all in individual large envelopes. And then I have a label on the outside indicating 
you know, what year it is, what players are on that particular board. Now you mentioned obviously, you know, <laughs> a rookie Hall of Famer or a star player, that board's going to have, you know, a, a higher value uh, than a lesser board or one that doesn't uh, contain uh, that that sort of, uh, you know, quality of, of player. Do you have one board in your mind that sort of uh, stands out above all the rest or is it you have so many – it's hard to, you know, one hard to pick just one. Well, the interesting thing about this, John, is that you know, there's no registry here. There's no, there's no way to know where those boards at the '89 auction went, um, and how many hands they've passed through by now, or if they got burned up in a fire, or lost, or destroyed. I mean, that's 33 years ago now. A lot of good yeah. stuff, quality boards were sold. Then so it's not like um, you know I can say okay I have the you know the seventy two Clemente I wonder where the seventy three is I, there's no way for me to tell where that is but I do have you know I have a lot of Hall of Famers um, one board uh, and this is just cert- just happenstance uh, I've got the nineteen seventy five full size board that contains both the rookie Brett and the rookie Yount on the wow. same board. That's um, cool. That's fortuitous. Uh, yeah. the, the artist put those two uh, of all players uh, from that set, the, the you know the best cards from that set on that same board. Yeah. Now, w- when you acquire these, are you just like, hey, I want to get as much of this as I can because I don't think a lot of this exists anymore? Are you – I mean, is it even possible to think, like, I have the whole set, you know, whether that's individual panels <laughs> or the com- – yeah, I mean, I, I don't think there's any way. I don't think there's any way to complete a whole set of cartoons for a year because yeah. they're just. I don't. They're needles in a haystack. Once you, uh, I mean, having eighty to a hundred cartoons from a year is a lot. Yeah, uh, because they've all been scattered to the winds. You know, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack, but you know, there might not even be a needle in the haystack. There's who knows where some of these have gone. Luckily. I think Topps had saved all its 78 football card art until 2003, and they started selling it. You have that piece right there in back of you. Yeah. That's from that 78. I have yeah. almost that entire set of uh, card art from 78 football. That's probably the year I have the most the highest complete percentage. set up, but you're never going to have a complete set. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, I, I, that's what I figured you said. I had to ask. I thought maybe I'd get – uh, surprise baseball wise you know you mentioned the football you, you you probably have a good percentage of the 78 which baseball year do you have the highest percentage of um i don't know that answer off the top of my head i have a lot of 72 um those are trivia questions i have a, a lot of 74 and 75 um i have a good deal of 65 and 67 69 um you know you go back there's i'm always you know thrilled to get a board with a hall of famer on it but i have to say it's becoming very very difficult to find full size boards and although the uh, materials acid free i've seen boards for sale over the years that you know there definitely have been um you know waterlogged they're warped with uh, yeah. water damage um smoke damage and those are those those aren't as nice. So I'm gonna put you on the spot. I actually drew out. I was listening to you, and I I have a, a Gretzky rookie behind me, which is 79. And uh, I thought there was, but I wanted to, to at least verify before I said something and, and been in, inaccurate. There is a a cartoon art on the Gretzky rookie saying how he's one of the most heralded prospects yes. uh, in, in hockey history. I think it's a, I think it's a hockey cartoon with him holding a stick, right? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Which which actually panned out, you know, he lived up uh to the cartoon billing. Uh I'm assuming you don't have that car I don't I don't I don't like to assume, but I'm assuming you don't have the Gretzky rookie card art. Um but what would like if you know I, what would something like that uh I, I don't want to like price you out in case it ever comes up and hopefully whoever owns it not necessarily but what would the value of something like that be that's amazing that you asked me that question because i know a little bit about this first first off i do not own it um but 
I know who does, and I know what that person was offering it for on eBay for a number of years. And I should say never getting this price. Yeah. It was cut. It was cut from a sheet. And I think the owner cut it um, because I bought some stuff from him before. And well, the hobby's the people. I won't say anything negative, but he was cutting up boards. And yeah. Gretzky's one of the cartoons he cut. And he was trying to sell that for $25,000. Just that cartoon. Yeah. And, but he would take it off. And then the next time I'd see it on eBay, it'd be for 50,000 and then 25. And I don't know what he was doing. I haven't seen it on eBay for a couple of years. Um, so yeah. either he found uh, a buyer or he just took it off, but that would be a very, very, very expensive cartoon. Yeah. I would think it would, like you said, it would be nice. You know, had it been part of the original sheet, I, I think you, you know, like you pointed out, he probably cost himself, uh, you know, uh, some dollar signs because he rather than just sell it as That's one, right. one big board with a Gretzky rookie uh, uh, card art, uh, he just sort of saw dollar signs and he sort of uh, heard his own product in in a in a sense. But at you know, when you're in the moment, he did the moment, you know, you maybe not thinking. Always along those lines, you're thinking, "Hey, I'll just I'll get rid of these eight or eleven other guys no one cares about, and just focus on this." When instead of saying, "Listen, you're paying for the Gretzky, and you're getting eight or eleven yeah. uh, other ones uh, for free," and a beautiful uh, but, board with all this original yeah. art on it and all the brush strokes, it's they're they're really attractive. Yep. You you mentioned, uh, and, and it's funny, for those listening, that was not set up. That was me asking a question and you having some inside uh, knowledge specifically about that, which is uh, funny there. Time for a quick break, but we'll be right back. Pastime Marketplace has a line of graded card cases that are waterproof, airtight, dust tight, and hardened to protect and organize your valuable collection. Each of our cases come with pre-cut and pre-formed foam, so you don't have to cut and tear the foam when you get your case. The pre-cut foam inserts are sized to hold PSA, Beckett, SGC, and CGS slabs. Store it all safely and securely with a case from Pastime Marketplace. Check them out at www.pastimemarketplace.com. Thanks for sticking with us. Let's return to the show. You know, you mentioned you, you part of your collection uh, is at the shoe, uh, Shoebox Treasures uh, in Cooperstown, New York, at the Baseball Hall of Fame, not too far uh, from me. How did that all sort of come about, if you want to tell that, uh, how that came about, David? Well, I was uh, back in Cooperstown. Uh, I'm trying to find the date here. I was back in Cooperstown in uh, 2019 with our family, and our younger son was playing in a baseball tournament. And uh, Shoebox Treasures was a brand new exhibit at the time that the Hall of Fame had put a lot of time and energy into, and it featured the history of the baseball card. But there was no focus on the artwork or the cartoons. I was hoping that there'd be a little mention of that at least. And so I inquired and was told that they didn't find any card art or originals that were suitable. Um, and so I told them I was happy to share my collection. And they were so gracious, John. They were just so, they were kind of, they were tickled and they were easy to work with. And it took a while for them to decide the dimensions they wanted and which pieces they wanted. But they displayed three of my full-size artboards, uh, from, one from 67 that had a maze on it, one from 69, uh, and one from 1974. And uh, I kept telling them, well, you know, you might want this one or that one. I thought, you know, the more star power, the better. They did take the maze. Um, but they said, you know, we we do a lot. You know, it's the Hall of Fame. We have a lot of Hall of Famers here. We want to show the card art from the regular players, you know, the commons too. Yeah. So the 69 board, I think the biggest star in that's Joe Torre. And I think on 74, it was that board that includes uh, Lou Brock. But they displayed – three full-size boards. They incorporated those into the shoebox uh, treasures exhibit. And those were on display from the spring of 2002 until uh, recently. 
Um, they display them for about 12 to 14 months. And then uh, I just received them back. Uh, they were shipped back to my house uh, not too long ago. But like I said, they were incredibly gracious. And it was, you know, it was a real thrill to have those pieces in the Hall of Fame. Yep. And also you were featured in, in the uh, Hall's uh, uh, monthly magazine, uh, Memories and Dreams. If I, I hope I got that right. I think so. Um, yes. Now I gotta ask you. I gotta be nosy because uh, that's I can be that sometimes. Like in in donating that, obviously lending it to. Them, are there any perks? Do you get like free admission? Uh, I know not. They don't necessarily. <laughs> yeah, I I um, well, what I let's be clear. I they, I didn't give them the boards. The they they you know they got they're to, on loan. They're on they, loan. They're, they're, they're on loan. Yours. And uh, yeah, I understand that. But they, the neat uh, thing was that. Like, they insured yeah, it uh, for like tons of money, and, and they made sure that I was, you know, that I had my insurance. That they got me an insurance policy. It was really nice. But as far as perks go, I came to visit. You know, our family came to visit our own, you know, card art, yeah. and uh, you know, they left us free passes, so we got into the Hall of Fame. But we're members anyway. But no, in fact, yeah. I, like you, uh, I gave to you know the guys who kind of arranged this and were in charge. I, I gave them each a, a piece of card art from 1972 baseball. And uh, they told me that they weren't allowed to receive gifts. And so mm-hmm. uh, it's in the hall's collection now. So they just, it's, it's part of the hall of fame, but no, I personally didn't get anything, but uh, you know, a great deal of satisfaction out of having them there. Yeah. And, no, no, and no doubt. The word. Yeah. I'm politicking for like anyone that donates, whether it be in your case, this original card art or other cases, memorabilia, or I think yeah, the, whoever do, is nice enough to do that. Uh, and when I say donate for display, that you still right. retain ownership. Um, but anyone that's willing even to do that, I like you should get like a lifetime pass for a couple <laughs> of them. You know, so. Well, you know, maybe they'll hear you say that, but I, it, <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. And uh, so I got to, you know, I, I we, we obviously talked a lot off the air uh, leading up to this on-air appearance. And I, you know, obviously when you talk about art, right, any kind of art, like we know, you know, hey, this artist did this piece of work. This artist did that piece of work. You know, even in the, the current uh, uh, art we're talking about, Project 2020s, and we know who the artists are. We know which items or, you know, which pieces are theirs. And I asked you, like, who were the artists that, that did this original card art and was, you know, surprised by your answer. And you said, I don't know. And quite frankly, no one does. And I thought you were sort of kidding. And you were like, no, no one, we do not know. No one's ever, like, identified who these artists were. And I was, like, shocked when you think about, you know, families telling stories or, Hey, what are you working on mom or dad? Oh, I'm doing a, a cartoon art for, you know, tops debate, you know, the sports cards, uh, like none of those stories lasted or, or were retold. Like we don't, uh, we don't know not one of these artists, whether they're male, female, um, if they're still alive, they'd be very old, uh, at this point. But even the fact that not even a relative or a friend or somebody, uh, you know, even knows you you talked i'll let you you even spoke to the man himself side burger and said you know you know who who are these folks and he basically and again i'll let you didn't have a, a an identity and like so to to think about that like when you know i i said this in talking to you you know we know we know artists from the 1400s 1500s 1600s and yet here is something done uh in in you know I don't want to say modern day, but uh, not that far back. And yet no one knows who these artists are. I guess, my, you know, my question to you is how, how is that possible? It just seems insane to me, but I'll let you speak on that as, as the preeminent collector of these pieces in your own right. Well, your question um, and the fact that it uh, bothers you it is exactly how I was feeling. It, it bothered me so much. These are such great pieces um, you, you grow up with the cartoons, you see them. I want to know who these artists were. I wanted to contact them and ask yeah. them questions. You know, who are they? What was their process? Uh, why didn't they take their art with them? How much were they paid to, 
to produce yeah. these cartoons. So um, in 2003, as the Topps vault was dwindling down and that last card art was being chopped up by Topps itself and so parted out as originals, I decided to just pick up the phone and call Topps. And I got a whole, I mean, with today's phone trees and computers, I can't believe <laughs> that in 2003, I was able to sit at my desk in Seattle, Washington and call Topps and actually speak to a live voice. And uh, I remember that I was passed along to a couple people before I got to someone who said, you know, why don't we just put Cy on the line? He knows everything. And it was Cy Berger. Yep. Cy Berger was like, he still had an office at Tops opening mail or, or something. And Cy got on the line. He was at least 80 years old. He spoke to me for a really long time. He was such a kind man. And we got to the topic of the 1989 um, Tops auction in New York City. And he knew all about the cartoons. And I said, I, hey, Mr. Berger, I'd really like to know who these artists are and how I could contact them. Did you have any information? And he just laughed at me. And he said, those guys are long gone. And I, yeah. I that's all that's all I got from him. I I imagine, John, if, if before you, the you, cartoons before, in the 50s and 60s, they're probably gone by now. Yeah. Um, they're no longer with us. Yeah. And they do might you not have been back then. Yeah. Do you sense like he knew and he didn't want to say names? Or no. He, he just no. didn't know himself. I think he didn't know himself. I started thinking more about it, you know. In 1969, for instance, baseball cards cost five cents a pack. Who knows what top, maybe tops hired just a contract artist and said, we'll give you $5 a cartoon or $3 a cartoon. And they were just pumping them out um, yeah. and leaving the boards with tops who would then take the photographs and match the cartoon to the player and produce the cards. And then the boards just went in the, in the storage closet. But side yeah. did not know the names of the artists. Yeah, that's, I, I still, even, you know, I know we've had multiple, now multiple conversations on this particular, you know, question, and I'm still, like, it's still shocking to me, like, to think, you know, my dad uh, is an amateur, but he used to do, like, Disney stuff in the house on the mm-hmm. on his, like, drawing board, and I'd check out what he's doing, and he'd say, hey, it's a Donald Duck piece, or, you know, whatever, uh, even when in its early stages, before you could tell what was what it was going to turn into. Um, I just can't, I, it's just shocking to me that a son or daughter didn't check out what a parent was doing or the parent didn't say, Hey, what do you think of this? Or even get an opinion. Like, do you think this is good enough? Take a look. I gotta, you know, get this to tops. It's going to go on the back of a, a baseball, football, basketball, or hockey, you know, that somebody didn't know. Hey, my uncle did that. I remember him showing them to me, you know, uh, my friend, uh, did some of those. We talked about it. Like, you know, stories live on through yes. telling it to other people. That's that's how many of the stories uh, live on. And yet, here we are talking about something that happened the 50s, 60s, and 70s. I mean, while it's not recent, it's not in, in the Ice Ages. It's no. Not in the me- and these are time. prolific artists. This These are people uh, – so let's say an artist – uh, was drawing uh, 74 baseball. It's clear from the art I have, it was the same artist in 74 that was drawing all the baseball cartoons, same artist for all the football cartoons, same artist for all the hockey and basketball cartoons. This person was producing well over a thousand different player cartoons that one year. Now you could go to the next year and it's a different artist. You can tell it's a different artist. It's just, yeah, it, it looks different. But then that artist did everything for that particular issue. Um, I picture this person, whoever these artists were, at a big drafting board uh, at Tops. With, I mean, these are these are ink. You see ink brush strokes on the side where they're dabbing mm-hmm. out their pen um, yeah. because they've they've put it in pencil and then they've sketched it a little more detail and then they finally go over it in ink. That's the final product. That's the original. Um, you're right. And yet maybe this was a side job for some people. They're picking up some extra money. Maybe this isn't their main job. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, we don't even know how many different artists there even was. Was there five over the year? You know, was there 10? Was there 15? Was it three? I mean, we, it's, it's one of the great mysteries 
of of hobby history, if you will. You know, yes. heck, it's, it's just a great mystery. Period. You are listening to the Sports Card Nation podcast. We'll be right back after this break. Stop. We are back. Side side didn't have any sort of insight to how many there were. Even while he might not know the name, he didn't give any any specifics at all. He gave no specifics, and you know why I thought Cy above anybody would know is because remember I told you about those the uh, paintings uh, of player paintings for the fifty three cards. Yep. That sold for so much. I mean, they're beautiful. They're iconic. We can all picture the 53 cards in our mind. Um, Cy bought, other than those superstars I just mentioned, he bought all the rest. It's called the Cy Burger Collection. Yeah. And when he was about ready to pass, I think he passed away in 2014, an auction house sold the Cy Burger Collection with all that original art from 53 tops. Yeah. And so he obviously had a love. Now those are paintings; those are different than the cartoons. But he yeah. had a love for this. They meant a lot to him, and yet, yeah, he told me his quote was, "Those guys are long gone." As he kind of yeah. just chuckled, like you know, that's distant memory, kid. Yeah, yeah, it's just man. It, you know, I'm just scratching my head how we don't even know who won. I would love to know. Were. Hopefully, someone listening to your show has a clue and. We can yeah, start. all joke, you know, all seriousness. If for some reason someone's listening into this uh, podcast, and we have a lot of listeners, and you have a friend or a family member, and you think they were involved in some of these, you know, uh, reach out. I'll have you give out your email here at the end uh, here in a few minutes, uh, David, where they can probably probably you're better to contact than me. I'm, you know, if I get, it, I'm just going to basically be the middleman sure. and forward it to you. Uh, anyway, but man, I, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a credit where credits do, uh, kind of guy. Even if they're not here, uh, alive anymore, you know, it's still, you still want to, you know, acknowledge who did these, you know, because as a, as a kid collector growing up, who then went back and started to collect these other cards, I learned so much, uh, from these uh, works, uh, more so than, than even the stats, and, uh, you, you know, know what so I. When I yeah, work with the uh, guys at the Hall of Fame on the shoebox treasures and my pieces, uh, this question came up. I asked them if they're, you know, they have, I mean, they have a lot of resources and ways to, to you know, go back into the archives and find things out. Uh, they came up dry on the artist names. Yeah. I got one more question pertaining to that. Do you think this is any, I don't think so myself, but I got to ask the question anyway. Do you think, you think these were outside, like you mentioned, contracted artists to do it? Or you think there's any way maybe this was people that were already employed by Tops that had sort of an artist background or enough to to produce these works that just it was they were just already working at Tops and they were just like, hey, we need we need card art and and blurbs for these particular plays. Or you think they were all outside the company hired separately? You know, there's no way for me to know. I, I, In my mind, somebody was hired, whether it was a TOPS employee or somebody who just contracted to do this for a few bucks per cartoon or yeah. a few bucks per artboard. I don't I don't know. But, I, you know, who knows what TOPS budget was back then for these things? Yeah. Um, who knows if it was just a, a thought of as a filler uh, space on the back of their product? I don't know yeah, how to do these. <laughs> And show you how my mind works. In my mind right now, it, it, those old enough to remember the, the Robert Stack hosted show, Unsolved Mysteries, and the music comes on. <laughs> yes. I, I'm, I'm seeing that when Robert Stack kind of walks in the screen and says, you know, tonight, you know, Tops Art, who did it? Uh, you know, <laughs> just something like that. It's just amazing we don't know one of these folks, let alone any, any of them. And uh, it's crazy. We know... So much stuff from history, from people telling the story, from one generation passing that information down to the next, and yet here we're talking about, you know, less, really less than a hundred, it's less than a hundred years old, and and nothing, and uh, just uh, it's weird to think about that. The more I think about it, the more like I'm shocked by that. But that's that's really where we are, and I think that creates some mystique, even more mystique about it is. You know, I want to thank you for for you know shedding some light on it 
for preserving this stuff. Like you said, so much of it's probably, you know, got thrown out, damaged, um, destroyed. Uh, who knows? I mean, do you think there's a lot out of the, you know, coming down the home stretch here, Dave? Do you think there's some maybe yet to be even be discovered, maybe in an attic? Who knows? Uh, no trail? doubt. No doubt. Um, five summers ago, I found five or six full art boards um, through eBay that some guy just uh, found in a, you know, his uncle's estate. He didn't even yeah. know what they, he listed them. Um, I called him. Uh, we worked out a deal. Uh, I, I mean, yeah, this stuff's out there. I think probably a bunch has gone into a landfill, uh, been destroyed, been forgotten about. There may be some people that uh, have a framed piece or two uh, yeah. in a card room or a special place in their house. It's hard to say. It, it makes me wonder, too, is that how we're going to find out one of the artists, right? They're going to it's going to be discovered. And it's, hey, that's my grandma's stuff, you know, uh, you know maybe. We, the only way she'd have that is she had to have drawn it. She didn't buy it. You know what I mean? Or, that's right. You know what I mean? I'm just, I'm, that's just the scenario. Is that, is that how we learn at least who maybe one of the artists is? Is it is discovered in some personal belongings of someone who maybe is no longer with us? And that's how we determine, like, they they had to have worked on the project because why why would they have, they have that in their possession? I hope so. so. I hope there's a photograph or there's an artboard that someone took with them or something. But Top, yeah. Top seems to have uh, you know scooped all these up and thrown them in a storage uh, closet yeah. for many, many years. It doesn't seem yeah. like artists were taking these themselves. Well, it's almost like a story still you know, waiting to, uh, to be told. Now, are you active in, in trying to acquire more? I mean, where are you at as far as uh, your collection? Are you... Are you, are you, is it something you're always on the lookout for, whether it be in person uh, or, you know, on an auction, on auction yeah. houses, eBay? I'm on the lookout. I, I wouldn't say I'm, you know, I'm manic about it. I'm on the lookout. I've found uh, a few pieces that were so waterlogged and damaged that I, I just wasn't interested. Um, it's, it's, it's like that more than not lately. I think, you know, these are, these are hard, these are hard things to locate at this point. Yeah. Well, again, I, I know I said it already. Thank you. You, 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 you know, you gave me one piece that uh, I'll always cherish. Uh, thank you for bringing attention to these incredible, you know, not just works of art, you know, an incredible part of the hobby and part of the hobby fabric, part of the hobby history. Um, you know, as, like I said, as a kid, I learned so much from these pieces of art with the blurbs, right? I learned hobbies, off-season jobs, nicknames, uh, you know, family situations, uh, all that stuff, all that stuff, other sports uh, that these uh, folks played besides the sport I knew them uh, in. And uh, you learn so much from, you know, a 10, 15, 20 word uh, blurb with, with a, a character. Uh, and it's so important to, Staying as a kid kept me interested uh, yes. in the hobby and the cards, and uh, uh, to to belittle that and say that wasn't important on my hobby journey journey would be uh, disingenuous. And I'm glad uh, there's enough, uh, even if it's mostly you, enough people out there that cared enough to uh, you know uh, purchase this, preserve it, and keep it so that it all doesn't go uh, by the wayside. And I I, I think it's uh, a great uh, part of hobby history like you said these are true you know we talk about one-on-ones right on the hobby and there's you know it's it's mark one-on-one but there's you know four variations so there's really <laughs> in a sense four one-on-ones or four cards these are truly one-on-ones the, the artist drew these like you said tops uh, uh photographed it or however they captured the work and then produced it uh, on the card backs and that's it. You know, they, you know, other than maybe an artist messing up and, and, you know, and like you said, you, you could see where they sort of kind of corrected some mistakes before they yes. finally put pen, pen the board. So like you said, they're truly one of ones. There is no, Hey, I, I did two pick the best one tops. These are on, you know, on, on storyboards. Uh, and uh, so to, to, you know, what you're doing is important part of of you know preserving the history 
uh, of, of sport, preserving the history of the hobby. And so uh, hats off to you. For well, sort thank of you, having John. The, the wherewithal to even think like that, you know, and, it, and, and reaching out to me and say, Hey, I'd like to come on and talk about this. And, and I'm like, yeah, no doubt. And, uh, you know, I, I, like I said, I honestly like, man, why didn't I realize, like, it is important to me. Like, I, I, and it wasn't like I didn't know about it. Uh, you didn't break news, but why didn't I really think to, like, you know, seek more information ab- about it? And uh, thankfully, uh, you know, you, you listened to the show, but you also reached out and uh, said, hey, let's let's do this and talk about it. It's important. And, and no doubt here, here we were. So I want to thank you for sharing uh, your insight, your knowledge. Uh, about uh, kind of a, a lot, I hate to, I, I guess pun intended, right? A lost art part of the hobby. Uh, and, uh, you know, still amazed that we don't know who these folks are. But That's right. Ir, you know, irregardless or regardless, uh, still important uh, part of, of the hobby that we know, uh, even in today's hobby. It's, it was that bridge that led to, to where we are. So well, it feels- uh, if you it feels yeah, like our hobby's contribution to American folk art, and it's important to preserve that history. Thanks so much for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, you know, give out that email. That, that way, just in the – you never know, right? It just takes one person to hear something and say, hey, I, I saw these at you know, my grandmother's house. I didn't know what they were. Or, I, I, you know, I saw them briefly, but now we're here, and I know what they are now. You know, and by that off chance, you just never know uh, an email where if someone has information, you know, maybe they know their uncle, their aunt, their mom or dad or grandparent was one of these artists. They can reach out uh, to you and, you know, let let you know uh, the information they got. Maybe we sure. can. Sure. Sure. My email, the, uh, yeah, go I can ahead. be reached at uh, David at Moody, M-O-O-D-Y 5.com. David at Moody, the number five.com. That's just an easy way to reach me uh, anytime. I'd be happy to respond. Yeah. And and if anyone has happens to have own any of this and, and, you know, wants to either sell it to you or whatever, I mean, you're interested in acquiring more. Or just talk about it or just answer yeah. questions or just, uh, you know, share a story. All right. Now I'll, I've, my memory works right. I'll put that in the show notes as well. So if you didn't catch it during the, the conversation, it'll, I'll, I'll put a little thing uh, for any, any information, you know, contact uh, you, uh, you know, honestly uh, at this point, the preeminent uh, person when it comes to this uh, card art, as far as ownership and caring about it and, and, you know, keeping that legacy uh, intact. Uh, I think it's uh, important. Well, John, you have an open invitation to come out and visit us in Seattle anytime. We'll show you the entire collection and take you to a Kraken game and take go. you to the best place you'll ever eat breakfast. So come, come see us. It's, I'm, I tell you what, it's tempting. We're gonna. I have to make it happen at one of these years. I, I've always said, you know, we need a we need a national uh, in that area. We could kind of kill two birds with one one stone. But even even if that doesn't work out, I'll have to figure out a way to. You know, even if it's for a three day weekend, right? Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, uh, make that happen. I'm a big Rangers fan, so maybe we could set, you know, we'll time it with a Rangers cracking game. And you time uh, it, we'll take you. Yeah. Well, I appreciate the the offer. I, I, I may uh, I may call you on that one, and uh, I'd love this. Obviously, love to see those intact sheets and 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 some of the you know that's it's a, a history of the hobby and i'm a i'm a guy uh you know i'm a, in the teaching prof- profession and in history i'm a i'm a history guy uh, just in general uh world history and country history and and obviously being a, a person in the hobby hobby history is right right there uh in, in, with those ranks uh, of importance and uh you know uh, i'm gl- like i said i'm glad you yeah, yeah, you contacted me to, to talk about this, uh, and and I learned some. You know, I knew a little bit, but I learned a, a lot, lot more. And uh, we love to see uh, all the stuff you talked about in, in person. So I, I appreciate that. Best luck at the national, John. All right, thank you. Thank you. Great conversation with Mr. Moody. We're going to take a quick break, but I'll be back with some closing thoughts. Great conversation with Mr. Moody. We're going to take a. Quick- Hey everybody, have you heard about Collectible? 
is the one-stop shop where any collector can buy and trade affordable shares in some of the most rare and valuable sports cards and memorabilia in the world, starting from just $5. From 1952 Mickey Mantle PSA 10s in Wilt Chamberlain's iconic rookie uniform to one-of-one Patrick Mahomes RPAs, rare LeBron James logo mans, and everything in between, Collectible is creating never-before-seen access and opportunities for all. Let's grow the hobby we love together. Please note this is not a recommendation or solicitation to buy any security. All investment decisions should be undertaken after doing your own research. All right, that's going to do it for this week's episode. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with David Moody. Uh, Thank you to David Moody for reaching out uh, as a fan of the show and say, hey, can we talk about this? And uh, like I said, I, you know, I was a little disappointed of myself as a, a kid of, of the 70s and growing up, starting with 79 tops baseball, but then backtracking to that, that vintage era stuff where I learned so much from those card backs, you know, that it took a little disappointed in myself that it took him reaching out to me to say let's talk about this but i'm glad he did i'm glad we did this episode i hope you enjoyed it hope you learned a few things how crazy is it that no one knows not one of these artists i think that's insane right like i said during the show we know ancient artists from you know medieval times and 1400s 1500s these pieces of art were done in the 60s and 70s and not one of these artists is known by name. And that's still, even saying that, uh, I'm shaking my head. You can't see me, but I'm shaking my head. I just, it's hard to fathom that. But that's that's the case, surprisingly enough. So, uh, but their work, uh, even though we don't know who they actually are, their work needs to be given the credit that it's due. I learned so much, and I know many other collectors and hobbyists and kids back in the day learned so much about these players some of them are idols uh from those card backs and those little blurbs and those pictures right and uh it was fun to to learn even more about it than that i didn't know and i uh, hope you did uh as well all right so we're about ready to start the national again hope to see many of you there in person a uh, couple shameless plugs. Thursday, July 28th at 11.30 a.m. For about 30 minutes on the Mike Burkus main stage. Myself and Danny Black, Sports Ball, and Tony and Oz from Cousins Collectibles are set to take the stage for Sports Card Nation Live. They are my honored guests, and they agreed to come up. We're going to be the quickest 30 minutes, but we're going to have some fun. I'll probably give out... Some hobby quick hit, uh, hit hobby quick hitch, uh, t-shirts uh, to somebody, to people in the audience. So uh, you want to be there for that, uh, and uh, maybe a little good content as well. And then the following day on Friday uh, at uh, 10 a.m. for an hour, 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Hobby Hotline are Saturday morning and Tuesday evening. Uh, conglomerate podcast will be on the Mike Burkus main stage with 13 of us. There's 20 of us in the show. 13 of us will be on the main stage and we like to make it interactive, take some questions uh, and, uh, you know, stuff you want to talk about. So uh, with 13 hosts, that, that hour will go quick, but we again hope to see you there as well. Uh, for those flying in or driving in like myself, Safe travels, uh, be healthy, be well, and we'll see you hopefully in Atlantic City.